Dr. Margaret Livingstone's work at Harvard has been called next-level cruel. She takes baby monkeys from their mothers at birth, then sutures the baby's eyes shut. Science or torture? And should she be stopped? That's next on The PETA Podcast. Welcome to The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this inside look at animal rights. Brought to you by PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. On today's episode, if you want to see just how cruel and sadistic animal experimentation can be, look no further than Dr. Margaret Livingstone's work with monkeys at the Harvard Medical School. Livingstone strips baby monkeys from their mothers at birth and sutures the baby's eyes shut. The research upset Dr. Catherine Rowe, a former NIH neuroscientist and now a PETA scientist, whose job it is to root out the worst cases of animal abuse anywhere. And Livingstone at Harvard Medical School was near the top. More frustrating is that back in 1985, it was thought that these type of experiments had been stopped. But here we are, and they're still being done. Except now, the scientific community is speaking out and fighting back against the cruelty. Here's my conversation with PETA's Dr. Catherine Rowe on the PETA Podcast. Dr. Rowe, welcome again to our program. Well, thank you for having me again. I'm very happy to be here. Well, it's important because suddenly this researcher of many years at Harvard uh, University has gotten into the news because she continues to do the research that many people may have thought had ended. And we're talking about one, Margaret Livingstone. She has done these experiments for over 40 years, four decades, and it includes the shutting of a monkey's eyes or sewing of a monkey's eyes shut. Some people may have recalled uh, historically back in 1985, this came to the public's attention and people may have thought this, this had, had ended, but no, it, it continues. So what can you tell us about this researcher, Margaret Livingstone? Margaret Livingstone is a, a researcher and neuroscientist at Harvard Medical School. Hmm. And we recently found out that she is taking infant rhesus macaques away from their mothers at birth, which we already know from the work of Harry Harlow in the 50s and 60s is absolutely devastating to their well-being. So she's taking these babies away from their mothers, causing them all kinds of psychological damage. On top of that, she is doing what are called sensory deprivation experiments. And what that means is she's depriving these animals of normal sensory experience. And she does this in two different ways. One of those is exactly what you described. She sutures their eyes closed for up to a year, or she deprives them of faces. And she does this by having them raised by people wearing welding masks. Hmm. So picture yourself, you're a baby monkey. You've been taken away from your mother. You're absolutely terrified. And now you're either completely in the dark or you have these monstrous looking creatures yeah. raising you. I mean, this is this is the stuff that goes beyond. You know, I see some terrible things every day. You know, that's my job. I read what sort of invasive neuroscience experiments are being conducted on all different types of animals. But when I saw this, my jaw dropped because as you said, we thought this was stuff that had ended because it's so horrific. And in the meantime, Margaret Livingston has been raking in millions of taxpayer dollars to continue this. Yeah, let me just break down these experiments again, because I have to admit that I wasn't sure when I saw the, the researchers with welding masks, what that really indicated. I thought perhaps it indicated that there was some kind of uh, environmental concern for the researchers so that they had to wear the mask, but it really was to cause more anxiety or more uh, to to test the monkey, uh, how the monkey would react to this android-looking researcher with a weld, welder's mask. 
Well, it gets crazier than, than that because she's not actually interested in the behavior of the monkeys or how this negatively affects their well being, which it does. She's interested in how their brain develops its ability to process faces. So she wants to see what happens if in the first year of life, you're not exposed to any faces. Does that affect the way your brain responds to faces? So she is absolutely not taking into account what this means for their well-being, not what this means for their social development or their ability to read social cues, the lack of eye contact, the lack of any natural interaction with another living being. She's just curious, if you never see a face, does that affect how you can process a face later on in life? Absolutely cruel and it's absolutely absurd. How long does this go on where the monkeys are exposed just to researchers with welder's mass? Up to a year. So for their first year of life, which is an extremely important period for normal social and sensory development, they are getting nothing normal. No mother, no faces, no natural social interactions. I am deeply concerned about what the effects are for these monkeys long-term. Are they able to interact with people? Are they able to interact with other monkeys? They have missed a critical window for development, which is exactly what she wanted. She wanted to see what, if she deprived them of what they needed during the first year of life, what would the after effects be? And then the the crazy thing is once the experiment is done, does she keep these and follow them throughout their lives or does she discard them? We don't know the answer to that question right now. I think it's a key question. We do know that for both the monkeys that she sutures their eyes shut and these face deprived monkeys, there is a series of what are very invasive tests. So in some of these cases, she implants electrodes into their brains. In some of these instances, she restrains their heads and she can do this with helmets or head posts, which need to be surgically implanted and then shows them pictures right? In some cases, faces or other shapes to see how this sensory deprivation that she has deliberately induced affects, you know, their visual system. But there is nothing that I can find on how their behavior is impacted. And again, we're doing extremely psychologically damaging experiments to these animals. I don't think she cares. I don't think she's thought a thing about what the impact of her experiments are on these animals. I don't think she's thought about it one iota. To what end is the impact of these experiments to humans? Is there anything that can be derived from this? Well, I think that whenever you're studying vision, I'm sure the people who are interested in how visual systems organized will probably try to argue, right? Oh, well, well, now we know that if you, you know, completely deprive an animal of all sensory input, it's bad for the visual system. But if we're talking about something clinically relevant, something that can lead to a benefit for human health, then absolutely not. You know, these are just curiosity driven experiments that have been going on for 40 years. They haven't resulted in anything that could benefit you or me or anybody else. The only person really benefiting from these experiments is Margaret Livingstone because she's getting millions of dollars in, in taxpayer money and you know numerous publications and scientific journals. And, and she continues to get curiouser and curiouser. I mean, she doesn't come to a conclusion to say, well, I've done this. Now let me you know, stop torturing the monkeys. She just continues to torture the monkeys. She just finds new ways to nuance her torture, right? So again, her earlier experiments did these sort of things with cats, same thing, suturing their eyes, seeing how that affects the way the visual system develops. And what you're seeing is just mild derivatives of that same cruelty. Now, I expect from scientists to evolve as new knowledge is acquired, whether it's about the visual system or it's about the animals, that they need to change what they're doing to reflect new information, right? I don't think that's asking too much from the scientific community. But what we see time and time again is that somebody like Margaret Livingstone makes her career early on doing these deprivation experiments with monkeys and other animals. She gets some publications, she gets some grants, she keeps going. You know, the fact that this hasn't led to anything 
to improve human health doesn't matter. She keeps getting the money and she can keep finding little new tweaks. You know, I'll I'll deprive them for six months. I'll deprive them for a year. I'll deprive them of all visual input or I'll just deprive them of faces. These are just little subtle changes that allow her to keep getting papers, but they're not getting us anything valuable in terms of, you know, clinical advancements. She continues to to do them, although back in the 80s, when it was first exposed and Peter was among the first to to expose uh, the uh, the eyes sewn shot of the monkeys. But this is something that she's done with other species. And when it became public, there was shock. But then what happens once the shock wears off, then she hides behind the cloak of science and says, well, I've you know, manage to withstand, you know, that, that scrutiny, let's continue on or. I think you're right. I think that, that sometimes people's attention shifts, but I also think that, that people who are doing these sort of extremely invasive controversial experiments start using euphemisms to describe what they're doing. So in Margaret Livingston's case, she doesn't say she's doing a maternal deprivation experiment. What she says is that her monkeys are hand reared, which is a euphemism for maternal deprivation. She doesn't say she's blinding the monkeys. She doesn't say I'm suturing the monkey's eyes shut. She says she's doing binocular form deprivation via eyelid suture. So you can see how someone who doesn't know to, to read between the lines could miss what's actually happening in that lab, which is maternal deprivation and sensory deprivation. But you throw in a couple of complicated terms or you describe it in a way that doesn't sound so invasive and you fly under the radar. Dr. Rowe, you know, people revere scientists, right? They they give scientists a wide berth because they think, people, the public thinks, oh, the scientists know better. They're on the side of science. When you talk about this kind of manipulation with language and this kind of manipulation uh, in mostly, I suppose, grant language and scientific language, it really hurts the credibility of science, doesn't it? Absolutely. I think that's absolutely true. I think that when scientists continue to do these extremely invasive experiments, these extremely costly experiments, hiding you know, what they're actually doing from the public, then getting exposed by us, of course, it's going to, you know, foster a sense of distrust in the public. And we don't want that because there is good science out there. We want people to believe the good science. But when people like this, people who are doing what is cruel and ineffective science are allowed to continue unchecked, it's not surprising that the public is starting to raise their eyebrows and say, we paid for what? Now, like, you know, to to add to that, I think scientists, we, I will include myself in that category, can be a little arrogant. We do think everything we do is important. We do get to a point where we think all knowledge is good knowledge, and we don't necessarily stop to reflect on how we're acquiring that knowledge. You know, is what I'm doing to answer this question that I think is important okay? Because I think this question is so important. I've stopped thinking about, you know, how I'm going about my research. And I think we see that time and time again in the scientific community. All knowledge is good knowledge, but that's not really true. Yeah, but what happens when a scientist like Livingstone continues to do this? What happened to the the backstops? What happened to peer review? What happened to the outspoken scientists? Surely uh, we can expect someone, uh, you know, a group like PETA to speak out and say, we need to stop these experiments. But what happened to those other folks who are scientists and who should know better? Are they just sitting on the sidelines because they understand that this is the racket, that this is the way science works in America? Sometimes, but not in this case. So um, this particular experimenter had a, a publication in a journal called PNAS, which is very prestigious, just about a month ago, Mm -hmm. and basically described part of what she does. She did not get into the eye suturing or the face deprivation, but she did mention that she was doing these maternal deprivation experiments. And the primatologists and the animal behaviorists and the bioethicists, they're in an uproar. Because like us, 
they thought this sort of thing had been ended because of its inherent cruelty, because we know that taking baby monkeys away from their mothers has such long-term negative consequences. They're as shocked as we are. They were as shocked as the listeners are that something like this was being allowed to continue, let alone at Harvard. In this case, the scientific community is outraged, at least part of them, enough of them. Well, I I heard that 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 kind of reaction was happening. Now, what happens? I mean, do they even have a right to speak out and say anything about the the research that they may or may not know a lot about or that, you know, they read, you know, in a journal and they're not intimately involved in the research? What kind of standing do they have and what can they do to maybe change something in terms of like what kind of future experiments are done or the funding of a Margaret Livingstone. I know that at least a hundred scientists have signed a letter to the journal. So they have signed a letter to PNAS that published this maternal deprivation experiment, but there are other actions that, that these people can take. They can write to Harvard and Mm -hmm. say, you can stop these experiments because Harvard can, they can say, you know what, this is not worthy of our Institute. This is not the the kind of science we want to do. These are not the kind of practices we want to do. You can also, of course, write to NIH who has been funding this sort of thing for 40 years now to the tune of $32 million. Mm -hmm. So there are things that people can do. And that, of course, it, it includes contacting the journals that publish it, the institutes that support it and the um, funding agencies that support it. I guess Harvard alum could also be uh, upset and say, you know, I mean, the recent report about Harvard is that they lost some money in their endowment. Their endowment is still worth billions, tens of billions of dollars, the richest school in the world, I believe. Would pressure from alums mean something? Of course. I think that Harvard takes its alums very seriously and alums are who give those donations, you know, they're, they're part of the prestige of the school, you know, who graduated from there, who got their degrees from there. So absolutely, if there are Harvard alumni out there who want to speak out against this, they should. This is next level terrible. Uh, next level terrible. Uh-huh. This, this is, I mean, for an experiment that has, has roots 40 years back, still continuing, it seems like it has a life of its own and cannot be stopped. It's like some kind of viral thing or is, or are there forces that are enough to say, no, you know, you have to stop or maybe only her retirement or only her, her leaving the scientific field on her own voluntarily. No, I think, I think that there are forces that can stop it. We know, for example, it was, I guess about seven years ago that PETA discovered that these sort of maternal deprivations were occurring at NIH, at their intramural research program by an experimenter named Stephen Sumi, who was a student of the infamous Harry Harlow and had continued that sort of research in his own lab at NIH. And PETA, as well as the same group of animal behaviorists and primatologists and bioethicists, the same group that's outraged right now about what's going on at Harvard, were outraged then about what was going on at NIH. And guess what? They shut that lab down. He was another 40-year. He had multiple publications. But the reality was that people who know what they're talking about said, this is not acceptable. And NIH said, you know what? You're right. And I think Harvard can do exactly the same thing. They just need to listen. But clearly, Sumi, Dr. Sumi, Dr. Livingstone, they're smart enough. They know that the kind of reaction they're getting. Are they merely being provocateurs, thinking that they're on the cutting edge of some science if they're getting this kind of reaction? Or is this just the thing they know how to do so they continue to do it and everyone else be damned? Oh, no, the latter is the case. They're not doing cutting edge research. They know they're not doing cutting edge research because they're doing the same thing they were doing 40 years ago. There's nothing cutting edge about doing exactly the same thing you were doing 40 years ago. But they keep getting grants. They keep getting papers. And this is what they know how to do. And so that I mean, this is this is a a pervasive problem in science, right? You get your training doing doing experiment type A. And you basically continue that for your entire career with these tiny little changes, just a little change here and a little change there, but it's the same package. What we know about the negative impacts of these sorts of experiments on monkeys now that we didn't know 40 years ago when the Harlows and the Sumis and the Livingstons got their start should end this. 
should end this. We know way more about how damaging what she's doing really is. So it's really kind of a generational thing. Science is evolving. They may ultimately go because new scientists are coming in with new research, but in some ways they're hanging in there because this is the game of science, right? This is the game of science and it is a game, right? It's just a a vicious circle of get a grant, do the experiments, get a publication, do get a grant, do the experiments, get a publication. What's not in that circle anymore is benefit human health. You know, it's just a circle of, I need to get my money. I need to do these experiments. I need to get a paper and we've lost sight of, We need to do something new. We need to get new information that will benefit humans. And it's it's a systematic problem, but it's a systematic problem that is causing extreme harm to these monkeys in the lab. And and not to mention the, the harm it's doing to the credibility of science, legitimate scientists, because I'm sure there are people who are listening to our conversation right now and they're saying, Oh, those animal rights people, they don't like any of this stuff. And, you know, I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt to the scientist who clearly, she's smart, Harvard smart, you know, they're doing something, you know, that it is going to be of value, certainly, right? I mean, that's what people on the outside might say when they hear a conversation like this. I think that's right. I think that people want to always give scientists the benefit of the doubt. We know in science that one, you know, somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of science in terms of science experiments aren't reproducible from from one lab to the next. That's a blow. You know, when you think about, well, trust all science, which science, the science from this lab or the science from this lab, you need to really be on your toes and really be prepared to evaluate it because not all science is good. We also know that there are a lot of scientists out there committing fraud and this you know, includes deviating from their protocols, but not telling anybody. This includes fabricating images in their publications. This includes plagiarizing from other experimenters. Science is not perfect. And the scientific community as a whole is not perfect. And it's important for people to assess science based on their own instincts, right? Based on really looking at what's going on, you can't really just trust science because it comes from the scientific community. It's not as trustworthy as we'd like it to be. And for those skeptics who might say, well, surely, uh, you know, something that she's doing might be right. Are there other ways to research the questions that Livingstone is trying to get at? Are there other more, you know, reasonable, less cruel, less torturous ways to get at an answer? Oh, well, certainly. I mean, again, with with human volunteers, you obviously can't take them away from their mothers and sew their eyes shut. But there are, you know, what are sometimes called natural experiments, right? There are people who are born with congenital visual atypicalities, whether that's congenital blindness or other um, visual atypicalities. And there are many researchers who study those individuals and see how their visual system develops in the face of these, you know, atypical sensory experiences. And those are, of course, immediately human relevant, you know, unlike what's going on at Harvard right now, which is just a mess. So it's the research at Harvard under Livingstone is not only irrelevant, but it may be wrong way redundant in that it's doing something that could be done less clearly less without uh, cruelty and clearly more applicable to humans. Exactly. Again, I always promote human relevant science because we know that so many of the experiments that come out of animal labs fail when we try to translate them into anything meaningful for humans. And when the experiments that like the ones at Harvard that are going on are so invasive and so harmful, I mean, that's just the, the penultimate example of a series of experiments that needs to be ended. And we need to look at the more human relevant work that is out there. And so when this paper that uh, Livingstone published, I guess it didn't surprise you that the, just the number of scientists who just were aghast at seeing this, this out there in 2022. Oh no. Uh, again, because I know how many people are well aware 
that maternal separation, maternal deprivation for infant macaques is so devastating that as soon as that paper came out, I knew there was going to be outrage. I mean, because again, this is the sort of thing that most people thought ended with Harlow and at the very least ended with Sumi when we shut that lab down. And here we are again at Harvard, where somebody is not only taking the babies away from their mother, but then subjecting them to all of these different sensory deprivation procedures. I mean, it's it's truly outrageous. Yeah. And is Livingstone, I didn't, I, I don't know her age, but if she's been doing this for 40 years, it would seem that she's probably ready to step down at some point. Well, I would hope so. But yeah. again, you know, people in science tend to hang on for a while. They don't necessarily retire at, at the same age as, say, people in other areas. So, and again, she's on the she's on the quote unquote gravy train, right? She's still getting millions of dollars in NIH grants. This is what always startles me when I I hear stories like this time and again. It just sounds like you use a phrase gravy train, but it really is like the welfare state of science in America, and there needs the public needs to know about this to see just how ineffective these dollars are are used in in the name of science yes well and again it helps that you're a harvard professor right so so if you're at an institute like harvard you're more likely to get a grant or get your paper published almost independent of the quality of the science right there's just an inherent bias in the same way that your listeners may hear harvard well if she's at harvard she must be brilliant she must know exactly what she's doing the same thing happens at the grant review level people see an application from a harvard scientist and they're like oh i'm sure this is good you know or people get a, a submission to a journal and they don't bother to evaluate it. that paper in pnas had no data there was no data included. She just said, these mothers get really distressed when I take their babies away. Yes, that's not a surprise to anyone who knows anything about monkeys or mothers. Um, and I gave them a stuffed animal and that seemed to help a little. And she it. got this published in a prestigious journal. This is basically the equivalent of me writing to PNAS and saying, I noticed that my dog really likes to you know, chew on a toy when I leave. And it's not science, it's simply anecdotal data coming from a lab from hell, if I may say that on the podcast, that because she's a Harvard professor, they just took at face value and didn't bother to think about the fact that there was no data, uh, the fact that these experiments are, you know, indescribably cruel, and the fact that she's not even publishing anything new. It's not a shocking piece of information that you take a primate baby away from a primate mother and the mother might feel some distress. You know, we've known for forever that in order to do this, you have to anesthetize the mothers. You have to sedate them. They're not going to give up their babies to somebody in a lab coat. They're just like human moms. Uh, uh, Not a chance. So going forward, what is the tack to maybe try to curtail this practice in the in the near future, uh, besides uh, people can write, but what is is PETA doing uh, in a campaign to to try to stop this? Well, we're doing a few things. Obviously, we have already written to the journals, we've written to Harvard, we've written to the funding agencies, explaining our concerns. We also have a website mm-hmm. that people can that people can go to. Uh, where they can take action themselves and immediately send very quick action to Harvard, asking them to shut it down. But, you know, I think the key thing here is making sure people know that this is happening, because even when this story first broke last week, I saw people doubting, you know, saying, well, this can't be right. This, you know, this is PETA just, you know, exaggerating, you know, and and then, of course, I would show them the publications and say it's right there in the method section. But but I think this is so outrageous. I think this is so unbelievable that people are shocked to the point where they think this can't possibly be happening in 2022. But it is. So I'm hoping that the collective outrage from the public, but also from the scientific community is going to really work towards getting this sort of experimentation shut down permanently, not just at Harvard, yes, at Harvard, but also not allowing this to happen again. I mean, this shouldn't be allowed to happen. Well, you're you're a scientist and to hear you uh, 
I'm I'm fairly mild mannered as a member of the public here, but you're a scientist, and to hear you uh, express yourself about these ex- experiments really should be telling. But what about the peers who allowed this to go through? I mean, that there's some there should be some kind of change there. I mean, you're a peer scientist. Well, you're a different you know uh, aspect of science. Well, I don't know. Would you call yourself a peer who could be on a peer review of this? I oh yeah. Well, I've never been on an I committee or an, an animal experimentation committee mm-hmm. um, because I all the research I conducted was with human volunteers. So basically that would disqualify me to be on an animal review committee because they really only want people who do animal experiments reviewing these things for a reason, right? Because right. people who are used to working with human participants, ha- you know, at least nowadays have a much higher standard for what you can and cannot do to another living creature. I think the standards for animal experimentation are are much lower. Um, One thing that concerns me in particular about these experiments in reviewing Margaret Livingstone's papers, not just the one, not that, not just the recent one about taking babies away from their mothers and giving them mothers stuffed animals, but the body of work, you know, the, 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 the last several decades of her research with these eye suturing experiments and these face deprivation experiments is that she doesn't describe them in any kind of detail, even in the scientific journals. And in listening to her describe her own experiments, both on her website and in this recent PNAS paper, I don't think she has any idea of all of the data that's out there about what taking babies away from their mothers does. And if she doesn't understand that, that means that it may not be getting into her IACUC proposals. So if the committee that's charged with reviewing her experiments at Harvard, so this is the IACUC or the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee at Harvard, they basically have to take her word for it, right? So if she says, you know, I'm, I'm using all the pain, you know, medications I need to after I suture their eyes or I'm feeding them on the right schedule or, um, you know, following this standard or that standard. It's very, very possible that no one on that IACU committee at Harvard has any information about what the long term harms of what she's doing really are, because I don't think she does which is terrifying, right? In other words, the IACUC is really essentially rubber stamping anything she says. The IACUC has to rely on the person proposing the experiments to give them the relevant information. And if the relevant information she put in the publications that I read or what's going into those IACUC proposals, it's not enough. It's absolutely not enough. You know, there's nothing about what the long-term consequences of never seeing a face She has published what it does to the brain regions that process faces, but never how that affects their behavior. If you've never seen a face, if you've never made eye contact with another living being, how do you interact with another monkey? Do do these monkeys have to spend the rest of their lives alone? Probably. Are these monkeys pulling at the sutures? I don't know. I don't know how you can sew a monkey's eyes shut for a year and not have those babies like instinctively trying to take those stitches out. I don't know if they're being restrained. She does not include any of that information in her publications, which means it may not be in the data that that IACUC was asked to review or the grant review committee was asked to review. So these are all questions that we have to hope that not just scientists, but members of the public ask so that maybe we'll see the kind of change so we can end this kind of experimentation in the near future. So absolutely. Dr. Rowe, I appreciate you coming on and talking about this and, and we'll follow how it goes and maybe, maybe it will end. Oh, I think it will. I have faith that this, you know, whether you're somebody, you know, there are a lot of people out there who are on the fence about animal experimentation. I am not one of them, but there are a lot of people out there who are on the fence. This is, this is something that will knock them right off the fence. Absolutely. You know, you cannot take babies away from their mothers and sew their eyes shut. I have I have a lot of faith that the scientific community and the public and better angels at Harvard, who I know are there, are going to really 
take a look at this and say, absolutely not, we shouldn't have been doing this. And, and hopefully at Harvard, at least feel some shame that they had allowed this to happen in the first place. I just can't envision it, right? Like I can't picture as a monkey taken away from your mother, immediately subjected to a surgical procedure, wake up alone. Maybe they have some cloth surrogate. You know, sometimes they give the baby some fabric thing to hang on to. You can't open your eyes, right? Mm-hmm. And you can feel that, right? Their muscles all work. So it's not the case that they're not physically capable of opening their eyes. Picture if somebody were like had glued your eyes shut, you know, and you wake up and there's nothing but darkness and alone in a cage. How is this? How? You know, like this is when I said next level, I mean it. You know, I get pretty, I see some pretty horrible stuff day in and day out. It's rare that I'm shocked by what is allowed because so much horror is allowed. But this is, I mean, and again, flying under the radar with these euphemistic terms, with these hand reared. Hand reared sounds nice. You know, you said you hand reared your dog. People will be like, oh, you love you. This is the opposite of nice. You know, this means that these monkeys are not getting anything they need. And it's not even like, you know, blind people, right? Blind people can use their hands to to process faces, can reach out and touch and and feel the contours of people's faces. They can speak and be spoken to. They're just getting these black sheaths. Yeah. It's crazy. Dr. Catherine Rowe, thank you for being part of the PETA podcast. Thank you again for having me. Dr. Catherine Rowe, a former NIH scientist and now a PETA scientist, whose job it is to find the worst experimenters, then lead the charge to end their work. To see more of what the Harvard researcher, Dr. Margaret Livingstone does to monkeys, go to the show notes and click the links. You can also stop animal experimentation in the labs. Go to PETA.org. And that's our show for today. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to send a link of this show to your friends. Tell them you like the PETA podcast. You can contact us at PETA.org. You can find me on Twitter at Emil Amok. That's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K. Or see my vlog at AMOK.com. Or see my work at ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. That's ALDEF, A-A-L-D-E-F dot org slash blog. Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on your favorite podcast app or on Apple Podcasts, where you can rate and review the show. Also, subscribe to the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo.